The impacts of water can devastate structures, so it's no surprise the humans have been managing water for as long as we've been building structures. Water can seem benign most of the time, but managing it properly is critical to having lasting infrastructure. So how exactly is water kept out of buildings? My name is Hafiz, and welcome to the Engineering Hub. Historically, waterproofing is just about as old as carpentry and masonry. When the Egyptian pyramids of Giza were discovered, archaeologists were baffled to find so much in perfect condition despite the annual flooding of the nearby Nile River. The Egyptians are estimated to have perfected bitumen emulsification around 3600 BC. Bitumen is also a key ingredient to most waterproofing systems today. In order to understand how water is kept out of buildings, we need to be specific about which types of water we're referring to. Generally, water demands on buildings are in three categories. Rainwater, or any water that's generally in motion, including wind-driven rain. This kind of water can flow into buildings through gaps in membranes, improper lapping, or capillary action. And this is usually addressed by having a steep enough drainage plane and positively lapped waterproof or water-resistant materials. We'll share more secrets about this shortly. Groundwater, flood water, or any water that's generally stationary and thus constantly applying pressure to the water barrier material, can be viewed in its own category too. If the constant pressure of the water is able to break down the water barrier, or seep through laps and cracks, then the water will flow through this path of least resistance into the building until the pressure is relieved. Here, it's much more critical to avoid any small pinholes, and the water needs to be held by a thicker and more durable membrane with much lower porosity than membranes only resisting, say, rainwater, since water constantly sitting or applying pressure puts much more load on the membrane. In foundations, this is commonly aided by adding gravel and drain pipes around the foundation to reduce the water load, the last and most tricky kind of water is humid air, or water vapor, which is water suspended in the air that can condense inside walls and cause rot. This type of water needs its own special barrier, often referred to as the air and vapor barrier, to make sure that no air with water vapor passes beyond a certain threshold to avoid condensation leading to rot inside walls. This kind of water is tricky because it can come from both inside and outside, so where do you put the barrier? The placement of, or even the requirement for, the air and vapor barrier depends on the climate zone and construction materials used. A common rule of thumb is that the vapor barrier goes on the warm side of the wall, since warm air holds more moisture, and when it cools down to the dew point, that moisture condenses, like water on your car in the morning. The vapor barrier is often simply a sheet of plastic, tape, or sometimes closed cell sealants or spray foams too. Okay. Now that we have a baseline understanding of the types of water that can get into buildings, let's put this into context. Over time, we humans have demanded more and more from our structures. Early structures were simple single-story huts, tents, or dwellings, only needing water protection from rain. Once we evolved to using foundations to carry heavier loads and utilize underground storage, we needed to protect from groundwater too. And then there's protection from water vapor which is a comparatively new design criteria. In many Western countries, water vapor plagues buildings, particularly buildings from more recent decades too. We began a study of this phenomenon to share with you in this video, but the problem seemed deeply region-specific. So we'll share our overarching hypothesis here, and you let us know in the comments if you agree or have a different perspective based on the construction you're familiar with. Focusing on some key issues from Canada and the United States here, Current water vapor causing condensation in building framing began in large part due to changes in construction practices from the 1970s and 80s. Heating costs increased from the 1970s energy crises, and there was a drive to build homes that were more airtight and with much more insulation, but often without proper consideration for how the framing would need to breathe to avoid condensation leading to rot. These more tightly sealed homes could save on heating costs, but they were unintentionally trapping moisture and causing rot. In comparison, even though some older structures may not have had air or vapor barriers, they were unintentionally able to breathe, which let wet materials dry out. In Canada, the water ingress issues of this era were brought to the forefront with what's referred to as the leaky condo crisis. In the late 70s and early 80s, there was a big boom in construction on the west coast of Canada, British Columbia. 
With that boom in construction came lots of construction practices from other locations with different weather than the coastal Vancouver. For those unfamiliar, Vancouver weather is basically a temperate rainforest, similar to Seattle. It's the second warmest city in Canada, and it's often called Vancouver too. The construction practices used in the boom were brought from much drier climates, and as a result, tons of water issues occurred. Walls got wet from both condensation and water ingress, and were never able to dry. It got to the point where half of all condos in the city were impacted, and any building constructed in a 15 to 20 year range was likely defective. Over a billion dollars in damages were estimated, lawsuits ensued, and government intervention programs even came into place. In many ways, this colossal failure event sparked the birth of building science as a profession, both for specialty contractors and engineers too. Some of the specific issues were that buildings were not being built with continuous, or any, membranes, and vapor barriers were omitted or placed in the wrong locations. Overhangs were omitted too, which kept walls and other elements perpetually wet. Most of these issues stemmed from a general lack of knowledge in both designing and constructing building envelopes, and partly because there wasn't so much of a need for this in other climates. Today, it's much more common to have a special trade or maybe even engineer on a project as designated as responsible for the building enclosure. That means the water, air, vapor, and thermal barriers. So how do these professionals properly keep water out of buildings? We'll highlight a few of the top design concepts here, and you let us know in the comments if you'd like to see a deeper dive. Number one, rain screening. This process involves creating a separate layer of the wall facade, which is designed to take the beating of mother nature from summer to winter, and this is the layer that the majority of the rain flows on. Then, behind the rain screen, is the primary waterproofing membrane layer. In addition to protecting the waterproofing, the rain screen has a vented cavity to help keep things dry. Number two, slopes and overhangs. The roof is obviously a very important part of keeping water out of buildings, and keeping water away from the building is one of the best strategies to reduce the likelihood of water ingress. This is why high slope roofs are so common, as well as overhangs that extend past the walls to help keep the walls dry. On top of this, the attic spaces often work together with overhangs that have vented soffits to manage air, vapor, and heat flows. But that's a topic for a whole separate video. Number three, belt and suspenders. This is a general concept about assuming the first layer of protection will always fail. Doing so can be expensive, but also creates very durable structures. For example, on roofs, several layers of membrane are installed, assuming that the water may make it past the first layer, but there's still more layers to protect beyond that. Even more durable is to add a high slope, which significantly reduces the water load on the rooftop before even challenging the first barrier. For water vapor, this concept applies too. First, you assume incidental water could get somewhere that it shouldn't be. And then you check. Is there a mechanism for water to dry in this case? If so, that's the belt to match your suspenders. Number four, completely continuous barriers. This one seems basic in concept, making sure all the waterproofing is continuous everywhere. But in practice, it can be a real headache to sequence all the different subtrades in construction to get all the layers to overlap in the right spots without missing any gaps. These are just a few of the main concepts, but it's certainly true that the devil is in the details here. So if you guys are interested, let us know and we'd be happy to share more on this topic. As society continues to demand more and more from our buildings, the problems that need to be solved get more complicated, so it's important to be continually evaluating our knowledge and sharpening our problem-solving skills. One great way for you to keep your problem-solving skills sharp is with today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. The videos we make for you here are designed to break down big concepts into understandable parts, and that's exactly what Brilliant does too with their thousands of interactive visual lessons, including new ones each month. We've particularly enjoyed their courses on neural networks like you see here. Navigating the modern world requires using STEM skills and breaking down complex problems into bite-sized pieces. Brilliant is here to help you train your intellectual muscles for this, which can be done in just 15 minutes a day. Get started for free at brilliant.org slash the engineering hub. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription too. Thanks for watching. Really, we make these videos for you. And if you enjoy them, give us a like, subscribe, and let us know if you have any feedback. See you next time.